Hello everyone. Thank you for tuning in today. If it's your first time, um, this is the AI Ghana weekend webinar. I am John Bagiliko, the data scientist and software engineer at Superfluid Labs. I'm also the Zindi country ambassador for Ghana and the team lead for AI Ghana. Um, Karim Ama from Egypt has joined us today and he's going to take us through how he solved the ICLR workshop challenge number two on Zindi. That is the radiant edge computer vision for crop detection. Karim won the first position and ultimately presented his solution at the ICLR 2020 workshop on computer vision for agriculture. Um, before I give him the chance to do his presentation, I would like to thank Zindi for giving us the platform, um, as well as their winners to talk to us on how they solved their challenges. So we are much grateful to Zindi for that. So Karim, if you can hear me, I think the um, floor is open now, so you can go ahead with your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you for having me. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Karim Amir. Uh, let me just introduce myself uh, first. So I back 2016 received my bachelor, uh, bachelor degree from Cairn University. And the same year I started my master's degree. I'm still working on it. I would like if I can finish it in the next couple of months. Uh, so since 2016 until 2019, I worked as a research scientist in, at my university, specifically at uh, the Ubiquitous and Visual Computing Research Group. Uh, we work there on uh, aerial imaging analysis using deep learning algorithms. Uh, afterwards, I went uh, to Siemens Healthineers as a research intern. I worked there for a year. I just turned in uh, last February. So regarding uh, the science competitions, this wasn't my first one. I, I worked on Kaggle before on Kaggle competitions. I uh, got a rank of 90 and 17 in two different competitions. Um, uh, if you want to like follow my work and know, know more about my research, you can follow me on LinkedIn or at least check my Google Scholar profile or Kaggle profile. So, let me take you through the competition. So the, the crop detection from satellite imagery competition, the main objective was to classify the planted crop in a small crop field, in a given small crop field, into one of the following classes. So either it is maize, cassava, common bean, intercropping of maize and common bean, intercropping of maize and cassava, intercropping of maize and soybean, and intercropping of cassava and common bean. So the goal was to identify the crop into only one of the following, uh, one of these uh, classes. So the provided data was a uh, time series of high resolution satellite images of an ag agricultural area in specifically in West Kenya. Uh, it was acquired in uh, 13 different days within five months. Each image in the, in the time series uh, was quite large uh, around 4,000 pixels by 6,000 pixels, and it has also 13 spectral bands. The number of annotated uh, crop, crop fields in this area was around uh, uh, 4,600, only 3,200 uh, 3, uh, was for training. Uh, to describe more uh, the data, so this is uh, part of the, one of the satellite images. And it, it, it's, it's overlaid with the uh, annotated crops. So given like uh, a crop like the, the blue one, uh, the, the goal was to identify what's the crop uh, that's planted in this area. You can see that uh, a lot of annotated crop, uh, fields are really small. And that's one of the challenges in this data. 
So I mentioned before it has like 13 spectral bands. So for, for normal images, you have like uh, the red and green two channels only. But actually, we, we can acquire uh, other channels from with different wavelengths. So specifically, high-tech satellite uh, satellites can capture like uh, alongside the RGB channels something like the visual near infrared, the ultra blue, and short wave infrared. Also, in this competition, it's provided a cloud probability layer to identify uh, in, uh, in in the pixels uh, the probability of uh, having like a large cloud uh, in each pixel. So the class frequency uh, of this data. So uh, you can see that the, the maze is the dominant class here, and it's totally unbalanced. Unbalanced, Specif especially the intercropping classes are uh, having really low frequency, which which should make things harder. The area of the the, 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 the histo this is the histogram of the uh, area of uh, the annotated fields. You can see also like, uh, as we mentioned before, it, most of the fields have like only a couple of pixels, only like four or five pixels, which is really, really, really small and insufficient information. Also, so this, this uh, in this step, I try to visualize the skewness of uh, the information in each band. So uh, if you are if you are gonna use uh, neural network methods, you you assume like that your data is normally distributed, but this is not only the case. So if you have like a large skewness, that that can hurt your training. So uh, I measured the skewness of each band, and uh, I figured out that after applying square root operation. Also, the skewness uh, can be decreased, which will be very, very useful to us in the training. The challenges uh, from the above, from the previous analysis, you can see that how small is the data set? Only like 3,000 training samples. Also, it's very high dimensional. You, we have like a, a time series of 13 images of the same area. Also, each image has like a 13 spectral band the classes are totally unbalanced, and the crop fields uh, vary in area, and some of them have only a couple of pixels, like four or five. So the the summary of my approach was to uh, to crop a small patch around uh, each field and pass it to a deep neural network for classification. Uh, the, mod, the, deep, the deep neural network model was trained using extensive augmentations to, afford, to avoid overfitting. So uh, before I started training, I set up my local validation strategy to have, uh, in order to have like a, a local score that's close, as much close as the leaderboard. So initially I start with uh, one split with 75% in training, 25% in validation. And after, if my idea that tried uh, successfully decreased the error, I turn out to 10 splits with 25, 85% uh, in training, 15% validation. Uh, all splits are stratified to produce similar distribution and, cl and class frequency between training and validation. And that's really important because the, the metric is cross entropy and it's really sensitive to class distribution. So random splitting wouldn't work in this case. So the first step uh, in the approach was to generate the small, batch of the small patches that we talked about. So first I calculate the center of each, uh, the center pixel of each crop field. And around the center, I take a crop of 32 by 32 patch so that the, the, the total size this batch would be uh, t, t by c by h by w. t represents the number of time steps, which is 13. And c represents the number of spectral bands, which is 13 in this case. And height of width, which, uh, which both are 13, uh, 32. I also crop around the same center, uh, what I call field mask, which is uh, just a binary mask 
to identify which pixels are actually belong to this field uh, and which are uh, which aren't. The size will be like uh, one by one and by height and width, which is 32 by 32. So this is uh, the design loop I followed to reach my solution. So usually I start with like standard model like uh, ResNet or VGG, but in 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 our case we have which uh, we don't have like a pre-trained model for this data set, and it's really small. So standard models didn't work uh, for me on this data set. So I start with a simple model like one layer ConvNet and then try to increase the model complexity uh, by adding more layers or by adding different layers like uh, gated recurrent networks or LSTMs. Uh, also, you can try to increase the layer widths uh, by, and by layer width, I mean like the number of neurons in a fully connected layer or the number of, uh, the number of channels in the convolutional neural network. So this step will, will make your model complex, but uh, eventually it will, make, it will increase the overfitting also. So uh, as a countermeasure, you try to, to decrease the overfitting by either doing more augmentation, try to improve your uh, input features by pre-processing or increasing the, the number of features. Also you can try using um, uh, Boolean layers, which is, uh, quite cheap in, in computation and doesn't have parameters and it can increase your model complexity without adding to your parameter space. Uh, also some tricks for smoothing the predictions can be used like uh, having an ensemble of multiple models, not a single model. Also using snapshot ensemble algorithms or stochastic weighted averaging uh, can really help to decrease the overfitting. And between step two and step three, I go back and forth until the competition time is out. So for the data pre-processing, uh, firstly, uh, I removed one of the short wave infrared bands, specifically band 11 at uh, 1610 uh, uh, wavelength. Uh, I also added the three vegetation indices uh, like uh, NDVI, NWI. So vegetation is usually used in uh, an earth observation analysis where, uh, where scientists wanna uh, identify area with uh, high, uh, large vegetations. Uh, so it's, but it can, can be also useful for uh, training neural networks. It has been proven uh, in many other works, uh, previous works. Uh, so after this step, the total number of spectral bands uh, bec uh, become 15 instead of 13. The last step in the pre-processing uh, is the normalization. So I applied the square root to decrease uh, skewness as uh, I showed before. Also I applied standard scaling to have like a zero, a zero mean and new standard deviation. So regarding the data augmentation, which was really crucial in this competition, uh, so I, I use different kind of augmentation. First, I use uh, spatial augmentations by rotation, flipping, and random cropping. Also, I use uh, mix of augmentation, uh, which is like a weighted summation of the input batch uh, and the, and the randomly selected uh, batch. Uh, so it's it's like so if you have uh, your original batch, it, it can be multiplied by 0.9 and uh, plus 0.1 of any random batch. It can be, it can be at like random perturbation. Finally use uh, time augmentation to, like I said, we have like 13 time steps. Uh, so each, each training step, I randomly drop uh, one of them and pass uh, the batch to the neural network. So this is my final uh, model architecture. Um, so it has like uh, four parts. The first part is a convolutional neural network, which passes through the the images uh, across the uh, the images of each time step to generate new uh, high dimensional features. So it takes like the, the 15 spectral bands and output another 
128 uh, new features. The second step is to apply the musket averaging pooling. Uh, I will talk uh, uh, more detail in more details in the next slide about it, but simply uh, we, we, I, I tried in this uh, layer to extract a 1D vector for each time step uh, for the next layers. Uh, afterwards, uh, gated recurrent network uh, is applied across the time steps to have like uh, a features globally in all time steps. And finally, there is the, the classification layer, uh, which is a fully connected and softmax to output the, the, class the, the class probability of each of the seven classes. The masked average, average pooling is simply the, the input batch multiplied by uh, the field mask we generated before. So we can only take the average of pixels that actually belongs to the field. Like I said, we have, I have like a 32 by 32 patch and for some cases I have only four or five pixels that actually belong to the field of interest. So I only take these four pixels and take the, uh, the average of these, uh, of their features. Uh, so the final step uh, in my approach is to apply, generate an ensemble of uh, of multiple models. So in, in this, in, in my case, I generated uh, 10 models trained on a different 85% of the training data. And also each model was trained using snapshot ensemble. So snapshot ensemble is uh, assembly uh, done by training the model was cyclical scheduler. So you start with a high learning rate and you keep decreasing it until you uh, reach like a zero learning rate. Uh, for, this is for a single cycle and you start uh, the next cycle from the same high learning rate and you decrease it again uh, uh, for like multiple times and Hello. Hi, Karim. Uh, hi hi John can you hear me yeah okay I'm, I'm seeing some messages could you up your voice a little bit so that um, oh okay uh, sorry uh so uh as i was saying i was talking about the uh snapshot ensemble algorithm which uh, can generate like uh multiple instances of a single model and that's this is done by training uh, the model with cyclical scheduler so uh this, the procedure is simple so you start by a high learning rate and you keep decreasing it until you uh, reach a learning rate with uh, zero. And then you start your next cycle from a high learning rate again, and you keep repeating this uh, cycle multiple times. And you take the, the model at the, at the end of each cycle and you create an ensemble of all these models. It's, it's really useful to decrease the overfitting. I tried it multiple times on, uh, on different data sets. So using uh, the all previous steps I discussed about my approach, I was able to uh, achieve the first place in the competition and quite uh, low score compared to the, the leaderboard. Um, yeah, so uh, I think one of the, uh, so to, to recap, like, the, the two most uh, important keys in my solution was to use like uh, an extensive, extensive augmentations to train the neural network on uh, such small data set and also to create an ensemble of multiple models to ensure your prediction are, are smooth as much as you can. So let's conclude my solution for uh, this competition. Uh, and I wanna end my presentation with some remarks on data science competitions so I worked on uh, worked before multiple data science competitions, and I went to work in industry for one year. So I want to talk a little bit how about uh, how how can we learn from the competitions, and what's the difference between working on data science competition and working in a company? So uh, the, what we can we learn from competitions? Simply, you can gain practical experience. So 
Yeah, suppose you like you learned recently uh, some deep learning courses. You, you want to try the algorithm and see how it works. Uh, competitions are uh, a really useful background for such uh, experience. Also, uh, usually people engage in discussion forums about the new state of the art methods that can apply that can be applied on this on this data set. So it's it's a good way to 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 know the new state of the art methods. Uh, of course, you can learn from the experts in the competition. Uh, most likely, you will have uh, you ha you you will see people who are more experts than you in this uh, in the competition, uh, and you can increase your experience just by learning uh, their solutions. And most importantly, uh, uh, doing uh, doing competitions can increase your uh, the weight of your CV uh, a lot. So if you uh, so if specifically if you if you don't come from like. A, a very popular university like MIT and Stanford. So, and people don't know like your education institutes are not that popular. So, adding doing the extra work like participating in competitions can really increase your uh, the weight of your CV. On the other hand, so uh, what can't we learn from competition? So, uh, when when you work on a competition, you work. Uh, on a nice clean data set with a clear objective, but it's not working on data science, this, it's not usually the case. So, you know, in, 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 real, in uh, real life setup, you start by uh, knowing what is the problem that you want to solve. That's, that can be, uh, you can get that from either a user requirement or a research problem. Uh, also, get the comp in the competition get the the data uh, already collected, but in real life you will have to do this step also by yourself, and you will have to also maintain the annotation quality uh, that's being done on the data in order to have like a meaningful model at the end uh, of the project. Uh, so that's it on uh, my presentation. I want to just uh, at the end uh, thank. Uh, Allah first and foremost for guiding me in life and also secondly thank I want to thank Radiant Earth Foundation and Zendi platform for organizing such competitions. Uh, I want to also thank uh, all my mentors that helped me through my career Dr. Muhammad Al-Hal and Dr. Noah Zuhairi, Rida Magid and Mahmoud Abdul Gaid. Uh, I want to also thank uh, my friends uh, Karim and Hussam, they are my friends in life and research. We constantly talk about research for the past eight years. So if I'm better than anything, one of the reasons would be uh, talking to these guys. Uh, and finally, and one most importantly, my family for their answer for uh, unconditioned support and uh, love. Uh, thank you very much. I will be happy to take your questions. Yeah, um, thank you very much, Karim, on your presentation. That was so cool. Thank you. Um, inside as well. So yeah, um, if if anyone has a question, you could note it in the um, discussion section, and then I would read them to Karim so he could answer them as they come. So we already have a question here from Francis Anochi. He says, "What approach did you use to handle the imbalance problem? Do you mind going much into it?" So, uh, so I, I didn't uh, actually uh, try to solve the, the, the class imbalance problem because uh, the, the, the competition metric was, is really sensitive to the class distribution. If, so if you, if you try to uh, mess with the, the balance uh, of the classes, that will really hurt the cross entropy uh, score. So, yeah, but in the case I'm, I'm, I'm gonna use to, uh, if you have like competition with uh, an F score metric, for example, that which, which cares about, uh, uh, which gives like similar weight to each class, even if the classes uh, are unbalanced, uh, I would try to solve this issue. 